Hello, I'm Yvette Torres, and welcome to another edition of The Road to Recovery. Today we'll be talking about prevention and early intervention in behavioral health, promising practices. Joining us in our panel today are Kristen Brennan, Executive Director, Fairfax Partnership for Youth, Fairfax, Virginia. Dr. Richard Brown, Professor of Family Medicine, School of Medicine and Public Health, University of Wisconsin, Madison, Wisconsin. Gail Ritchie, Public Health Analyst, Center for Mental Health Services, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Rockville, Maryland. Dr. Pierluigi Mancini, CEO, Clinic for Education, Treatment, Prevention, and Addiction, Incorporated, Norcross, Georgia. Pierluigi, between 2002 and 2011, the total number of adolescents that received prevention messages through the media went from 83.2% in 2002 and 75.1% on 2011. Are we reaching enough young people with prevention messages? Well, I think the question is, how are we trying to reach the youth with prevention messages? I think that the development of technology today has given us an opportunity that we haven't quite caught up with. Um, traditionally, we have public service announcements, we have school activities, but today we have Facebook, we have um, texting, we have an ability to find new ways that we haven't quite exploded yet. So the media we have to look at from a broader perspective, not just the broadcast media, but everything that the youth are using today. That's correct. And I think that what we're doing is we also need to measure or find a way to measure how it is that we are reaching them through this new media. Absolutely. And Kristen, you know, uh, the same figures hold true for the school-based youth. Uh, it went from, in 2002, from 78.8% .8 of all youth that were in school uh, receiving, in, in um, adolescents to be specific, that were receiving messages through their uh, school-based environment to 74.5% in uh, 2011. Uh, what do you think happened? I know that for our programs in Northern Virginia, we do survey our youth annually. Um, starting in sixth grade and going through 12th grade. And so that has enabled us to learn a lot, a lot about exactly what's going on. We ask them about all kinds of behaviors and practices. Um, so it gives us more information than we used to have. And what and information are you getting? We're learning which trends are improving, which ones are not. Um, things such we, as? Such as suicidality, um, the number of youth who have considered or attempted suicide. Um, bullying behaviors, the numbers of youth who have either reported that they have bullied or been bullied in the past year. Um, and every year we are tweaking those surveys to get more information. Um, they're l listening to the partners as they say, you know, I think we need to ask kids about this so we can get better information. So we're getting more information and that enables us to tailor our prevention practices a little more. And Gail, in terms of the mental health um, issues with youth, particularly in light of the current incidents, what kind of messages should, be, uh, should we be sending? And are the, are the ones that we're sending now being effective? Well, there are a variety of messages <clears throat> that we can send out. Um, I'd like to use uh, our grant program um, that is taking the good behavior game, which is an evidence-based practice, um, to 21 uh, elementary schools across the country. What the literature tells us is that two major risk factors, early aggressive and disruptive behavior by elementary school boys in particular, lead them to be at risk for a variety of outcomes, both mental health problems as well as substance abuse problems. So by going early into a young child's life, we can begin to put them on the developmental track that works. And um, this seems to be working across the country. And Richard, this all assumes that the best way is through messaging, yes, but once the youth is affected in some way, they really do have to be assessed. What does that mean to be assessed? 
Well, it's really important that we look at youth who are having problems in any sphere of life because this is often such a web of risks that are interrelated. Um, but it's also important that we recognize that everybody in this age group is at risk. So we really ought to be screening children on a regular basis. And this all can children. happen. All children, absolutely. So this can happen in uh, medical settings, uh, but it can also happen in schools. It can also happen through other youth serving organizations. And what is the definition of screening? What should a parent uh, be knowledgeable about in terms of screening? What does that entail? Yeah, it's real important that parents be knowledgeable because often parents hesitate a bit because this does involve asking kids some pretty personal questions. And parents hesitate, you know, is this going to be in the record? Might this haunt my child in the future? But in reality, it's real important that we be asking kids questions about tobacco use, substance use, uh, various symptoms of mental health disorders so that we can identify issues early and head big problems off. And this is from the parent's perspective. Pier Luigi, what happens, what should the parents and friends of those youth also be cognizant and on the lookout for? Well, I think parents need to be um, in the lookout for any change of behavior, any change of friends, any change of attitudes. Um, friends need to be cognizant about those changes for several reasons. Um, you know, we are learning more and more. We used to think that the parent was the most important voice in that children's life. Um, today we're finding out that it's older siblings and friends that are the most important voices. So as parents, we also have to keep an eye on who are my children's um, friends and as um, for those who are positive friendships to make sure that we continue to support those positive friendships. But we, need, we do need to look at uh, changing behavior, change of clothing, change of attitudes, um, and also some uh, isolation and some of the other uh, negative type of behaviors that we're pretty much learning that it leads to some unhealthy symptoms. And Gail, you know, you mentioned the whole notion of uh, the youth that are affected by some mental health problems that also go to addiction. Uh, for youth 12 to 17 who experienced depression in the past year, and this is 2011 data, they were two times as likely to take the first drink or use drugs mm -hmm. uh, than, than other youth in that, in that cohort. Talk to me a little bit about that. You know, this reminds me, we can approach it two ways. One way is to look at the issue of early intervention, or intervening early in the, in the course of the illness. So you want to try to find people that are beginning to experience depression at the point of being a diagnosable problem. And what would problem. a youth act like if they, if they were beginning to experience depression? Well, oftentimes they withdraw. Um, their behavior is not like it was before. They're less social. They might report that they can't sleep or they sleep too much. They have um, less of an appetite or more of an appetite. These are important things to look for. And sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes kids will actually be depressed, but actually more agitated and acting out more. That's right. I'd like to also add a point about prevention here. Uh, Dr. Greg Clark from Kaiser Permanente uh, a number of years ago did a wonderful study. He knew that mothers within the health organization who got depressed um, put their kids at risk. So he then developed um, and studied, and we have the um, good randomized control trial that lead us in this, that he developed an evidence-based practice for youth whose parents were depressed, who are not yet depressed yet. And so it's a preventive intervention, it's a cognitive behavioral um, uh, format, and uh, I think it's very encouraging. And Kristen, how does the, um, the school system then um, you can certainly do your surveys, but what do you do when you do begin to see a pattern of behavior within a student, and how do you capture that, and how do you approach that student? Well, it's of the utmost important that the school personnel are working together. Um, we have school social workers, counselors, and psychologists, and in some cases we also have a substance abuse support person from our CSB, the Community Services Board. And um, they are working together and communicating on the youth who've come to their attention and then strategizing on what, how they can best support that youth. Now, of course, the school systems are, they're limited in what they can offer in treatment. So where programs like ours as a nonprofit agency come in is to 
um, make families and the community aware of what resources are there for them so that they can seek effective treatment for youth. And going back to something Gail was saying earlier, um, you were talking about how um, early aggressive behavior is a, is a key um, thing to be aware of for, for young children. And we're really, at our organization, trying to bring attention to the fact that we want to start paying attention at that point um, and bringing effective treatment and therapies to youth at that point rather than waiting until later when there's a crisis that occurs. You know, the other issue that, that you mentioned that you try to get them treatment, well, we know for a fact that only about, I would say, 10.8% of the people who really need treatment of the 20.6 million that are affected, and this is the, the entire population, 12 and older, that have a problem. So how do you begin to weed out and, and, and with those families to try and get them help? Mm -hmm. Um, there's actually a program, a, na a national campaign called the One in Five Campaign, which states that one in five, um, one in five youth have an issue, and and of those five, one of them gets treatment. That's sort of the rule of thumb that we that we go by. And um, so, there are a lot of different things that we try to do in our community because we're we're aware that nationwide it's a problem with resources. Um, providing access to effective treatment is a huge problem across the country. So when we come back, I want to continue with that uh, train of thought because I think that will be very helpful for our audience. We'll be right back. We want everybody in the community to understand signs and symptoms of mental illness and of addiction, so that, at, or even a, just a, a, an emerging problem, so that um, individuals can uh, know when either themselves, their family members, or a neighbor or friend is having difficulties and they may need to reach out for help. So increasingly, we're trying to help people understand what addiction about, is about, what mental illness is about what mental health conditions are about and what substance abuse is about so that we can identify these signs and symptoms sooner and so that neighbors can uh, help neighbors in um, reaching out and getting the help that they need. What SAMHSA is doing with regard to uh, facilitating the integration of the assessment of mental and behavioral health uh, problems in the primary care settings, our, our major initiative is the Screening, Brief, and Invention Referral to Treatment Initiative which lodges the screening in the primary care setting. Uh, so as part of the primary care team, what the uh, mental health counselor or the substance abuse counselor would, would be doing is asking questions about alcohol and drugs and uh, also dealing with uh, uh, mental health issues. Recovery benefits everyone. Substance use and mental disorders can be treated. It all starts on day one. Join the Voices for Recovery. For information and treatment referral for you or someone you love, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. So Kristen, do you want to continue telling us exactly how you help those parents um, try and seek help? Yeah, um, one of the things that we've been doing over about the last year is a community education program. Um, I had the opportunity to go and speak to all of the, about 500 counselors in our public school system. We have one of the largest public school systems in the country. And um, give them information on helping youth not only to access the services that are available, but some, some information about self-care. So we do a lot of um, community education around the importance of sleep and nutrition and exercise and things like that so that youth who don't have access or who aren't ready to access treatment um, have some strategies that they can pursue on their own. But um, I've also done that program for parent groups, for PTAs, and um, we're actually going to be having a TV show um, coming up in the next couple of months on our local um, government channel where we'll be talking about a lot of those kinds of topics also. Um, we do advocacy around the community. We work with our local government and the school system because, like I said, we're not pro a non-for-profit. So um, we are not linked directly to the government or the school system. We're, we're kind of working in between with the community-based organizations. And Gail, is, does that parallel some of te techniques and approaches that uh, you do in some of your programs? 
Yeah, so it reminded me of the concept we we use in a couple of our programs, which is, and, and for prevention in particular, we know that um, um, mental health professionals, for example, most of most of prevention will not be done by the mental health community, but it will be done by people in the in the social settings where children are. So in the program in which we're moving the good behavior game to elementary schools is the prime example of how teachers are preventionists. And I think that's also another way to, to look at the problem of early intervention, trying to find kids who are just becoming uh, ill with mental health or substance abuse problems. Um, we, we know that if we can train those that are in the, in the social sphere where children are to know more about these issues, then, then that's a way to, a way to get them to treatment. You know, and I really wanted to um, mention when we had our prevention program, we started it in the middle school and we moved it down to the elementary school. But the important component for us, because we started mental health promotion at the same time that we did substance abuse prevention, and our key component was the parents. Mm -hmm. We needed to have a very strong parental component because we, we work with immigrant parents. We work with Latino parents, and there was a great disconnect from what the children were learning and doing mm -hmm. to what the parents thought they needed to be learning and doing. And what we found out is the children were our partners in helping educate the parents about mental health promotion and substance abuse prevention. But you also worked with the parents. Correct. Yeah, you and trained the parents, because you had a very, very um, um, unique situation there for a while where you had a lot of suicides uh, in your community. Mm -hmm. Correct, and besides being the silent epidemic, um, in Latino families, it became a very difficult topic. So we did engage the parents. And today, actually, our, our suicide prevention program has grown, where we're now also training Latino youth to be uh, suicide peer mentors at the schools. And that That's program wonderful. is also beginning to yes. develop and uh, give us some excellent results. Richard, speaking about screening, uh, I know that you're working with physicians uh, in, at the University of Wisconsin and uh, medical school. And how, what does the program entail in terms of getting them to understand what they need to do in their everyday practice? Yeah, and actually we're working with not just physicians, but clinical settings throughout the entire state of Wisconsin. And one lesson that we learned early on is that the current staff, the physicians, the nurses, they just don't have time to do yet one more thing. So we've actually found that we can make the most progress if we help them expand their health key, healthcare teams, uh, and everybody has a role. So uh, the receptionist will ask the team to fill out a questionnaire when they arrive at the clinic. The medical assistant who checks vital signs will notice if there's a, a risky response or not. And then for those who have risky responses, there's a full-time, well-trained, well-supported, dedicated health educator who is trained in motivational interviewing and other techniques so they can really connect with that teen and, and explore with them what are the pros and cons of their behaviors. Uh, are they fearful of any risks? Are they already starting to have some issues in their lives that they wish would change? Um, and those are the kind of techniques that certainly physicians and nurses could learn. But again, they just don't have that amount of time to spend with the kids. If we can add somebody to the healthcare team who's really well trained and focused on delivering just this behavior, we can do much better. But under the model of screening and brief intervention, is this sort of, does it follow that model? Because under that model, people are taught uh, almost to do what you're saying, mm -hmm. but um, there are many settings who may not be able to add on uh, additional staff to be able to do this, and they use the, they train, I know that uh, SAMHSA, CSAT has trained uh, on quite a number of people uh, in being able to adjust their approach in order to provide that brief mm -hmm. intervention. Yeah, actually, and actually SAMHSA has supported both models. One model where the current staff, often the physician, actually delivers the service. Another model where we expand the healthcare team. And what we find is when we can expand the healthcare team, we more consistently deliver more evidence-based services of longer duration to kids. But for settings where the healthcare team cannot be expanded, then we certainly wanna take advantage of the opportunity to train physicians and nurses. And especially in rural areas where maybe it's 
if they expanded the team, there wouldn't be enough people to serve. Um, they even have to be more flexible and maybe people are serving multiple roles in the process. And Gail, what are some of the screening tools, and, and Pierluigi, what are some of the screening tools that parents need to be aware of for screening for mental health issues? Well, there are some basic tools I think that the primary care physician uses, and I think maybe you can help me on this question. And Rich, can you help me on that? Sure, and yeah, I don't, I don't know if I would envision parents using these tools, but in or certainly- being aware of them. Yeah. yeah, it certainly helps to be aware and understand that this is a good thing for their kids to get, but the, the tools that we use in practice are maybe an initial question or two, and uh, we don't actually wanna start with alcohol and drugs, because that's a little jarring for kids, uh, they're on their toes when they're asked initially about that. So maybe we'll start with something a little easier like diet or exercise or sleep. And uh, then we'll ask about tobacco and then we'll get into alcohol and drugs. Maybe we'll preface the questions on their drinking and drug use with questions about whether they know any friends who are drinking or using. And then a, a very helpful questionnaire to uh, use for alcohol and drugs is called the CRAFT, mm -hmm. uh, C-R-A-F-F-T, and each of those letters stands for a question. And then for depression, the PHQ-2 can be an, a good initial screener, and the PHQ-9 is more of a, a more complete yet still brief assessment instrument. And it's very easy just to ask the questions, add up the scores, and give an indication what level of risk or problem someone might have. We can never use these tools to make a firm diagnosis, but at least they're a good indication. Mm -hmm. And actually, if a parent is concerned, they can find these tools online, and if they have a good trusting relationship with their with their young one, maybe they can ask, but if, if they're not sure if they're the best person, chances are they're not, and maybe good to let somebody in a clinical setting handle it. And in our agency, we have a hybrid agency where we have a prevention branch and a direct clinical services branch. In, a, in both branches, we use the GAIN, and for prevention, we started adapting the GAIN short screener. And this gives us a real quick picture. Is this youth heading towards a path that we can help them avoid. For the treatment, we have a more thorough gain that gives us a, a lot of information about the youth, about all types of behaviors that we can use to help diagnose and to help develop a treatment plan for that youth. What are some of the questions that the short gain has, for example? Uh, for, well, the short gain will ask you about, have you ever used alcohol? Um, how many times in the past 30 days um, have you ever used tobacco? Um, have you, how have you handled a certain um, episode where you felt angry? So it starts dealing with managing emotions, which is one of the key areas that we work in our prevention program. Um, and then it can go further. It, it can be modified, but it can go further into sexual behavior, into um, other emotions and so on. Yes. I'd like to add, um, a, a, give a story. Um, I think thinking about this issue as a public health problem might shed some light on it. Um, Dr. Robert McFarland from Maine Medical School did a very interesting study that's very enlightening. He wanted to try to reach um, uh, late, late teens, early youth, early adults um, who, are, who um, are at risk for a psychotic break. And so what he did is his catchment area was Portland, Maine, and he trained um, counselors in high school, teachers. Um, I think it might have been parents, I'm not quite sure. But the idea is, um, I'm, I'm sure it was actually, that um, if these folks n began to know what, what are some of the signs, where most people would say, oh, they're gonna grow out of what he would say, please send me your, your person if they're showing these signs. And it turned out to be a wonderful way of actually lowering the rates of uh, psychotic um, behavior on the part of the population as a whole in that area. And when we come back, I do want to get to um, not only continue to learn more of what you're doing, Gail, but also deal with the issues of the peer counselors that I, I want to go back to. We'll be right back. For more information on National Recovery Month, to find out how to get involved, or to locate an event near you, visit the Recovery Month website at recoverymonth.gov. I felt broken. I needed help for my addiction and depression, and help was there. I found support as I rebuilt my life, piece by piece. With the help of my family and recovery support community, I'm rebuilding my life. And through recovery, I am whole again. 
join the Voices for Recovery. It's worth it. For information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referral, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Yale has a long history of pioneering research in substance abuse, and we've been able to take that even further with the SBRT research. SBRT, it's a funny sounding acronym, but it stands for Screening, Brief Intervention, and Referral to Treatment. Screening is very important because many, many folks out there who have substance issues never get any kind of intervention. ASPERT, by definition, is identifying those patients along the entire spectrum of use, from just risky use or hazardous use to those that are on the severe end of the spectrum and are dependent. ASPERT will identify those patients, offer an intervention either to reduce the use or to refer to a specialty treatment program. The heart of ASPERT is the BI in the SBIRT. Our version of the, the brief intervention is something called a brief negotiation interview. The BNI is comprised of four steps. It's build rapport, give feedback, enhance motivation, and negotiate a plan for change. I was actually surprised. When I came in, I came actually for, for a minor heart attack. So when I came in, I was I kind of surprised when they came in and they, direct, and they, they were talking to me about it, you know. It was the most thing about the drug problem is trying to admit it to somebody, you know what I mean? There's no finger wagging. Uh, it's, there's not a lot of facts and figures about what could happen to you, and it's not scaring you about your issues. It's a simple communication style that asks the patient to tell the practitioner the downsides of their problematic use, what they think is a problem with it. And not only that, but asking them to imagine what things could be better in their lives were they to cut down or to stop altogether or to even go on to treatment. Utilizing ESPERT in clinical practice and training physicians to utilize ESPERT in clinical practice allows us to identify patients uh, who might not otherwise be ready to come forth to their doctors and tell them about it. And also be able to have a skill to talk to patients about how to reduce their alcohol or substance use or get them to more specialized treatment. I ended up talking to um, some people in here that direct me to the right direction, like to programs, outpatient programs that were able to help me out. Because the SBIRT program is a very specific and practical skill set, we have a structure training program that helps residents, medical practitioners, nurses, PAs, what have you, learn it so that they are able to bring it from the classroom into the ED. We've also created the virtual coach, and the virtual coach is the ability to do some of that training online. The user of the program clicks through and picks what steps of the BNI to do with this patient. And depending on the level of correctness of their choices, the patient responds in various ways. Aspert gives the practitioner a needed skill in order to screen and intervene. It's a skill like any other skill that they learn in medical school, and it has the potential to improve the health of the public. I probably wouldn't even be here. If, if it would take me a longer time, the earlier the better. You know, I was able to catch it in the, in the stage that, you know, I'm not a long time user, but I am a user. So it was able to help me balance myself out and get, get myself into the help that I needed. I see many patients at the end stage of their disease, not only from their alcohol and substance use, long standing, but also from the co-occurring illnesses which can result as uh, from substance use. And so it's become vital to me, um, not only as a clinician, but also as an educator, um, to really promote prevention, to allow us to identify patients before they really have reached these end stage processes in their disease. And so bringing these prevention techniques and early identification techniques to the residents, I feel um, will only improve the healthcare of patients long term. So Kristen, we had mentioned before the whole issue of peer-to-peer -peer interventions. Can you talk to us a little bit and how does that work? There are a variety of ways that we can utilize the information, the expertise of peers to help each other. Um, there's peer mentoring, there's peer mediation. There are a variety of different things that we can do. Um, with peer mediation, we work with youth to help each other resolve conflict, which is a tremendously useful thing in this day and age because 
um, because there are so many opportunities for youth to be in conflict, not just in person now, but digitally. Um, we want to give them as many ways to resolve those conflicts as possible. What kind of things go on di digitally? Do they oh intimidate each other? <laughs> we are only just beginning to even get a handle on everything. It's exploding so quickly. Um, the, the common ways that they interact in a negative way, we'll say, um, that everyone kind of knows about are things like Facebook and Twitter and texting and uh, things like that. But there are a variety of other platforms online where youth are interacting that adults are only just becoming really aware of. Such as? Even things like Instagram. You know, they can, they can even have negative interactions with Instagram. So um, the, key, the key thing for parents to know with all of that well, really, there are two main things I would tell parents. One is to document things. The thing that teens don't often realize with um, digital harassment or bullying is that a lot of it can be documented. You can screen capture an, an, a mean text or a harassing text. You can screen capture things that happen on Facebook. Um, the other thing that I would advise parents to work with their teens on is to limit their limit how they're interacting on, on social media. Um, use their privacy settings on Facebook. Make sure that only the people that should see something are seeing it. A lot of teens are still making their, their profiles completely public on Facebook so that any adult can um, go on and see them, see where they're posting, see what their whereabouts are. It's a huge safety issue. Um, so the first thing as parents are allowing their kids to become active on the internet that they should do is first teach them about the safety issues and make sure that they're using privacy settings appropriately. So if a parent buys a, a young person for safety reasons, a, uh, uh, an electronic device, I mean, they should really be monitoring this. Absolutely. I mean, a, I would call it age-appropriate monitoring, yes. Yes. which means like the younger, the more vigilant that they have Absolutely. to be. Absolutely, but I really, I really think that uh, as a society, we tend to taper off our vigilance a little too early. We see a uh, uh, great leaps in issues around the middle school age and it's partly because of the natural changes in it, that youth undergo in middle school but it's also because parents tend to back off a little bit where they in, in situations where maybe they shouldn't. And Pierluigi that is where your peer mentoring and your peer support programs come in correct because they can actually take a look at that and and the youth are trained to detect, correct? Correct, and we actually have three different levels of peer mentoring. We have in our prevention program, we have a specific suicide prevention training with sources of strength uh, where we are training uh, middle and high school students to become suicide prevention peer mentors in their schools and to be known to other students in case those students have a question about suicide, they prefer to go to someone their own age or communicate in a way that they are more familiar. Then we have our uh, prevention peer mentors and these are youth that have gone through our traditional after school prevention programs like Too Good for Drugs and Violence or, or our own bilingual curriculum um, that, that SAMHSA named as an exemplary program. And uh, those youth are meeting at least on a monthly basis and they're developing public service announcements, media campaigns, texting campaigns to reach other Latino youth and to help them um, avoid alcohol, drugs, gangs, and, and those things. And then our treatment peer mentors is our latest program. We have a clubhouse model where we have substance abuse treatment for adolescents and we provide support services after school, tutoring, life skills, and so on. Um, we help kids finish school, get out of gangs, stop using drugs, and graduates of that program, we are hiring paid positions hiring as peer mentors so they can help the new members coming in. So their peer recovery. Correct. Uh, young people, well that's excellent, that's Thank excellent. You. Does that mirror anything we're doing in the mental health side, well, uh, Gail? I, I couldn't help but first of all, I, I applaud you for the work you're doing and also to think about our um, Garrett Lee Smith Youth Suicide Prevention Program that has, has a variety of facets and one program, sub-program is uh, we work with college campuses and we're doing the same thing, for example, in training 
a resident advisors in the dorm about signs of suicide. And that's who funds yes. us, is oh. the Garrett List Me I'm so glad to so hear thank that. thank you. Yes, you're very welcome. <laughs> <laughs> this is a wonderful way to meet you. Um, we also work with states and tribal communities, and it's the same idea of helping people within the social sphere where people, where youth reside, to know the signs of suicide, and then try to refer them for help. Um, you're a wonderful example. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. And Richard, let's talk about a little bit about integrated care. Um, does part of the training that you give, uh, uh, does it provide the whole notion of the continuity of care throughout the, the life cycle of an individual who may come into that system and, and a follow-up? Yeah, so um, our health educators in primary care settings, they're trained to take care of everyone from ages 10 and up with these behavioral issues. And uh, not only are they focusing on alcohol, drugs, and mental health, but they're also focusing on tobacco, diet, exercise, and weight issues so that uh, we avoid them taking on some of the stigma that unfortunately the mental health treatment system, the alcohol and drug treatment system takes on. In, in one of our clinics, when we got started, we really just focused on alcohol and drugs. And the health educator at that clinic got to be known as the alcohol lady. And we realized, no, this is, this is going the wrong way. So when, when we expand and cover a wider scope of behavioral risks throughout the age spectrum, uh, then these health educators get to be known as general health resources, and then the patient doesn't have to feel awkward when they walk into the room and, and uh, you know, did anybody see me? But I tell you, it's much easier to walk into the room of a health educator in your family doctor's office or your pediatrician's office than it is to go maybe across town and run the risk of being seen walking into a treatment program. Oh, so because of the discriminatory fears <coughs> of, yeah, of and, discrimination. And the stigma, who's gonna know? And as, as you were saying, you know, all it takes is one Twitter message and everybody at school knows. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, the more we can bring these services into places where teens already feel comfortable, whether it's school or their doctor's office where they go for a sore throat or a sprained ankle, uh, I think the, the more participation we'll have. And also we need to also be keenly aware that because of the new uh, health care reform and, and what it's going to offer in terms of that whole integrated care, correct? Yeah, it's, it's very exciting that part of health care reform that many people don't know about is a strengthening of some of the enforcement of previous mental health parity bills. So we're going to see many more people now have access to services. We also see strengthening of requirements for reimbursement for some of these screening and intervention services uh, that in the past were largely unreimbursed and we had to just depend on the altruism of, of the healthcare practitioners uh, to implement these services. Which Pierre Luigi will certainly help you out, correct? And, and what should nonprofits be looking at in terms of this new opportunity? Well, one of the things that we are currently looking at is how are we going to partner to bring a primary health clinic to our agency that already sees over 600 families per week for behavioral health services. The, all of these families need primary care services. So having them all under one roof will not only guarantee continuity of those services, but it will guarantee a bigger prevention of physical health. For example, obesity, smoking, diabetes, all of those illnesses, um, along with uh, mental health and substance abuse prevention and promotion, um, belong in the same roof, under the same roof. Well, I think, I think that certainly that will go a long ways, not only in, in, in looking at that, uh, that sort of re what we call recovery-oriented system of care correct. for that community, correct? Correct. And are you going to partner with some of uh, with with a hospital, or are you partnering with a healthcare provider? We have two different options. One of them is to partner with someone. So we're currently uh, speaking with some partners, a physician, a pediatrician, um, or we can do it ourselves and just have someone. You want to bring it in house. So that's another option for for programs. Again, our communities are recently arrived immigrant communities, and once we have their trust, they will continue to come back we have their trust. So for me to install a primary health clinic right where we are located will guarantee the flow of patients. Absolutely, well when we come back, we're gonna talk more about additional efforts. We'll be right back.
Every day, I seek a positive direction for my life. Through my accomplishments. And now, with help. And support from my family and others, I own. I own. I own my recovery from addiction and depression. Join, Join the, the Voices, Voices for recovery. recovery. It's worth it. For information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referral, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Westfield High School is located on the, the western part of the county by the Dulles Airport area in Chantilly, Virginia. We have approximately 2,750 students here. We do have a student services department here at Westfield. It comprises of the school counselors. We have a school psychologist and school social worker. I kind of look at the counselors as always being the, uh, the first line of defense. And they want to make sure that kids in the school succeed and they want to make sure you do your best at all things, even if they have to push you a little bit. What we try to do is be proactive rather than reactionary. We, we sit down and talk every year about our programs and what we do here to try to see how can we sort of more get ahead of the issues rather than just reacting to them. Some common issues that students face is peer pressure, especially with drugs and alcohol and all those things. And I think for mental health, it's more of a, we don't talk about it mentality. It's hard to kind of, to be open about it because you don't want to alienate yourself. The earlier you catch it, in most cases, the more treatable it is. You, so you're not just preventing, you know, more of the suffering if you catch it early, but you're actually going to have better success with treatment. So they need to catch these like warning signs early and get them help and see what's okay, if they're going to be okay in the long run. The program that we used for our depression awareness program this year was the SOS or Signs of Suicide program that's written for high school age students. It really focused on the students and what they can do. There's a low smirk factor on it. You know, high school kids are prone to smirk at things, but this one was really well done. They played out scenarios and there was information about depression, uh, information about suicide. So it was partly to introduce our screening tool, but also it was an education program. And it showed new things because it never talked about the depression stages and, and how to catch depression when you need help. So um, it showed me new ways of how to get help and you know the ways you can and how to help other people. After the video, we took a survey and that survey was completely private. She did it individually and then they took it and they gave it to the counselors. The counselors all got together and, and went around all the different classrooms and collected the materials and then took them down to a central location where there was a bunch of counselors, a director of student services, a psychologist, social workers, and people were sorting them based on answering questions whether we needed to see them that day, that week, that month. We stirred up a lot of kids that uh, probably wouldn't have come up on our radar before and some had really significant issues, uh, some fairly scary scenarios. A lot of kids got help. We gave a lot of resources out. A lot of students got to, you know, get it off their chest, whether it's true depression or just screaming for help. Is, you know, at least they, they got to be heard and they got to talk about it. They gave us this paper with all the numbers and hotlines you could call. They show you how to, what website you can go to, the people you can talk to, and in school we have a counselor. And all the teachers are pretty friendly and it tells me more about how to get help for my friends or myself. It was definitely a big help because it showed me that I could go to my counselor and talk to them if I needed to, or my parents, or any adult that I really, really trust. Three months later, I had a student come to me in the cafeteria concerned about a friend and saying that they had remembered some of the um, concepts that were from that day and knew that they had to go talk to a trusted adult. Our hope in the future with expanding our program is to try to infuse it throughout the school year so then the students will know that it's a topic that they can talk about and be comfortable to talk about with a trusted adult and that's what we're hope is to do in the future with programming. 
Richard, you certainly work at a university that's keenly engaged in, in helping to train individuals to do prevention, early intervention, so on and so forth for, for behavioral health issues. What about those other physicians that are still providing services and, and have not put on the cap of integrated services? What would you say to them and where could they go for for making sure that they know how, how to best treat their, their patients? Yeah, well, th there's lots of educational opportunities and it's interesting, there's actually studies that show that most physicians choose to be further educated on topics that they're already familiar with to deepen their understanding and, and their specialty expertise, whereas this field calls on people to kind of come out of their usual areas of expertise and get involved with something new. So there's lots of opportunities to come learn, um, and but so often it, it's it's before that. Do, have people decided that this is a gap in their practice? Have they decided, wow, especially for kids, these behavioral issues are the number one health threats for them. So maybe rather than learning a little bit more on cholesterol issues or or infectious disease, gee, let's let's figure out what we can do in our practice to address these number one risks uh, that kids have. A lot of people don't really conceptualize addiction this way, for example, but addiction is basically a pediatric illness. It starts when kids are in their <laughs> teens and blossoms more when they're adults and is responsible for tremendous loss of life, uh, tremendous loss of years of life. And uh, I just hope we can sway more healthcare professionals in general to pay attention to the behavioral realm. Uh, it's responsible for 40% of deaths in our country. And clearly uh, it's not getting 40% of attention and training. And not to mention the cost to society uh, for all the, all the addiction problems. Absolutely. Um, Pierre Luigi, uh, do you get an opportunity to train some of the physicians that are not within your clinic or working within your clinic? Do you talk to the medical society or? Well, one of the areas that we've been lucky enough to be able to address is the culture and language barriers that occurs when we're addressing uh, substance abuse and mental health issues. And yes, we have had the opportunity to uh, speak with the family physicians and, and other pediatricians and, and general physicians in Georgia um, as to how do you address this in general, but also how do you address this for the growing immigrant communities that every state is facing, including Georgia. Um, we also have the opportunity to talk not only physicians and, and pediatricians, but other professionals in other areas that um, are present when we're dealing with our population. That includes juvenile justice, the school system, um, other professionals that will have interaction with youth um, that may not be aware as to what is needed. Um, so we, we have had um, uh, Georgia conferences and, and we're lucky that we have the Georgia School of Addiction Studies every year in Georgia where we're able to attract a lot of professionals, uh, counselors and preventionists um, to the conference to be able to educate yeah. them. I, I did want to bring up ASAM because they can always go to ASAM, ASAM the um, American Society for Addiction Medicine yeah. has tremendous number of, of um, uh, treatment trainings, correct? That yeah, they have they don't necessarily have to specialize, but they, they can become more aware. Yeah, they, they offer a, a one-week course, uh, which can move people from novices to real experts. Another way to get excellent training is to seek out a course on motivational interviewing. Mm -hmm. Uh, motivational interviewing is a very empathic, respectful, collaborative approach where rather than sort of the old style physician says, hey, you better not do that, you could die, this and so forth, that rarely changes behaviors, especially in teens who resist that kind of authority. But with motivational interviewing, we help kids take stock. Gee, you know, what? Do, first of all, you know, may, we acknowledge there might be some things you like about this. But gee, are, are there any fears that you have? Have there been any downsides? And then we get kids to think about, well, what's important in their lives and how does their drinking or drug use uh, really fit in? And many kids will take stock and, you know, maybe I could have just as much fun if I drank a little less or avoided using that drug or stayed away from those kids who engage in riskier behaviors. The key is helping kids decide for themselves that they want to make a change rather than telling them. And that's what motivational interviewing does. So it's a wonderful thing for physicians to get trained in. Excellent. And speaking of motivational interviewing, in your program, Kristen, 
how do you get youth engaged in, in, and how do you keep them motivated? Right, well, one of my favorite things that we've come up with in the last couple of years is our teen handbook. Um, we became aware through all of the work that we do in the community that one of the biggest challenges that families face and that teens face is figuring out if there is a problem, what do I do next? Like, how do I even access the kinds of help that I need? And um, so we developed this teen handbook that walks them through step by step so that um, first they can find out, okay, well, am I even dealing with something that's unusual or is this sort of just what teens typically go through? So there's basically an introduction to all kinds of issues that teens face from eating disorders to um, Asperger's-like behaviors, um, all the things that they may have not, never really heard the, the actual terms for or they don't really know if it's typical or they're different. And then from there we say, okay, well, if you've identified that you maybe need some help or you wanna to talk to somebody, you know, here are the people in your community you can talk to. And then if you really need a formal assessment, and we're obviously, this is for parents more that we're gearing it toward. If you need a formal assessment, here's how that process works. And here's what you can expect. Um, here's how to navigate your insurance through this process. Here are some typical obstacles. I work with a lot of, um, school personnel and parents on how on earth do I get through the insurance process. It's almost prohibitive for a lot of families. It's just so much. They're working, they have so much on their plate already, and then to be calling 20, 40 potential therapists and or psychiatrists and then figuring out how to pay for it, it it's just too much for a lot of families. It's quite daunting. Yeah, so we put it all together in this one handbook and then we also go out and do presentations based on that handbook to give people that information. When we talk about youth, how do we know and how do we assess if and when they're ready to really take on a peer role? Because I think that's very important. Not all youth are gonna be ready I think that for us in the prevention side, uh, the way we recruit is either through referrals from some teachers that said, you know, this would be a good candidate, um, but also how they respond, how the youth responds to the offer, how the, how the youth contributes to what it is that it needs to be done. We give them empowerment so they can develop um, their style. So there is a job description, if you will, but they can develop their style and depending on the energy that goes into that um, and how they respond to it, then they become candidates. For the treatment peers, the ones that have completed the program, of course we look at how they did in the program, um, but also we wait for them to, make the first, to take the first step. Um, you know, we, we let them know there's candidates, there's these positions that are open, but I think that youth um, being self, empowered, identify. Exactly. They see themselves in that position and to us that's one of the most valuable tools. Well, it shows, uh, depicts leadership. That's right. And desire. Gail. I was just thinking uh, the Center for Mental Health Services has been a national leader in developing what's called Youth Move right. to really help youth become national leaders, to help others, um, you know, take away the stigma of asking for help or being in treatment. Right. And we're very proud of that. Mm -hmm. We think that's a growing trend. It is. We can all work together on that, That's I think, right. together. That's a great program. program. Yes. I'm going to ask the entire panel now, if you were looking at a crystal ball, what would be your one um, area where you think that we need to improve, given everything that society is facing and given the challenges, the fiscal challenges that we have, where should we be going in the future? Kristen, I'm going to start with you. I really think we have to look at prevention and treatment as the investments that they are. I think too often we wait until there's a national crisis and then we and then we spring to action and I think it's more important that we look at working with kids at the ver very earliest stages of showing that there's a problem whether it's um, potential substance abuse or aggression or anxiety which is a huge huge problem um, and that we, we, we intervene as soon as possible and that we don't wait until a crisis happens. Richard. Well, I'll focus on, on general health care, and I think 
where things really need to go and they're already moving in that direction is a much greater emphasis on these behavioral health determinants. It's, you know, we spend so much time doing physical exams and lab tests and uh, working with patients around cholesterol, blood pressure, and all these numbers, but actually things like tobacco use and alcohol use are actually uh, much stronger determinants of health and, and premature mortality. And uh, so either we need physicians to be able to shift in that direction. And for many settings, we need to expand the health care team so there's folks who really can dwell on those issues. To make that happen, of course, there, there needs to be appropriate financing of services. We can't ask clinics to just take this on out of their own generosity. They can't lose money doing this. Uh, so right now, the next biggest thing that has to happen is Medicare, which is already willing to reimburse these services when they're provided by physicians, needs also to be able to reimburse them when they're provided by health educators and other paraprofessionals who are working under the supervision of physicians. And they can take much more time. They can become much more skilled at motivational interviewing over time. So we really can have the same kind of expertise in behavioral health issues in general health care settings as we have on cholesterol, blood pressure, diabetes, et cetera. Very good. Pierre Luigi. Thank you. I, I think I would begin by saying we need to continue to think outside the box. We need to get tech savvy. We need to meet the, the youth at their level. Um, we need to provide support services. You know, we have youth that get into these situations many times because they don't have that kind of support at home or in their communities. Uh, the examples I've given for Georgia is we have been blessed with a lot of support from our Department of Behavioral Health where they are helping us with these clubhouse models to be able to provide those support services and develop these peer models. Um, we also need to stop confusing children and we need to develop the tools for adults and other peers to correct the misinformation. Gail. Well, if I had a crystal ball but also had some power and money with that thought, um, I think a couple of things. I would hope that our country would move towards looking at families as a whole. That in a family, a mother could be depressed, for example. So if you treat her depression, you're actually helping her as a, as a mother do her motherly roles. Oftentimes when people are treated for mental health problems as adults, they're never asked, are you a parent? And we have some preventive um, evidence-based practices to help people become positive in their parenting, which can affect the outcome of their children. I guess I would also say that we need to think of kids developmentally, and we know that um, mental health and substance abuse problems come on at different developmental stages. And the literature tells us that we have about a two to four year window between early kind of weak signs, there's something wrong to the full diagnostic criteria being met. And so we need to intervene in that time. So I think those are the two messages I suggest. I want to encourage our audience to go to the, our Recovery Month website at recoverymonth.gov. And I want to thank the panel for such a great show. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Our thank pleasure. For a copy of this program or other programs in the Road to Recovery series, call SAMHSA at 1-800-662-HELP or order online at recoverymonth.gov and click on the Video Radio Web tab. Every September, National Recovery Month provides an opportunity for communities like yours to raise awareness of substance use and mental health problems, to highlight the effectiveness of treatment, and that people can and do recover. In order to help you plan events and activities in commemoration of this year's Recovery Month observance, the free online Recovery Month kit offers ideas, materials, and tools for planning, organizing, and realizing an event or outreach campaign that matches your goals and resources. To obtain an electronic copy of this year's Recovery Month kit and gain access to other free publications and materials related to recovery issues, visit the Recovery Month website at www.recoverymonth.gov or call 1-800-662-HELP.